Can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay. Um, my name is Sheila Knesman. I'm Associate Director of Financial Aid at UMass Amherst. And I've been doing financial aid for, I don't know, close to 40 years. It's been a long time. Um, I've done this for both of my children. They've both gone through the college admission and financial aid process. And um, you can do this. You can do this. Absolutely. By the time this presentation is over tonight, um, you'll have lots of good information. It's a, it's a very robust presentation. There's, I think, over 40 slides. So in order for us to get to all the slides in a timely fashion, if you could hold your questions until the end. And then if you've got the question, more than likely someone else in the audience has a similar question. So I'll repeat the question and then answer the question as best I can. Is there any way that you can get that light off my it's like a shiny light on um, me? Yes, you're doing. Um, so MIFA, Massachusetts Education Financing Authority. Um, this presentation should last about two hours. So um, there's an evaluation form for you to fill out at the end. So hopefully you all took one of the evaluation forms. Um, unfortunately, I have to go like this to progress the slides along. So um, let's talk about MIFA. So MIFA's public service mission is to help families navigate the college financing process. So if you haven't done it already, bookmark MIFA.org. They're, they're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, and all of these presentations, they've got really great presentations. So go on to their website, and they've got how to fill out a FAFSA form, they've got how to fill out a profile form, we're gonna talk about all these different financial aid applications coming up. And they also have the Meet the Pathway, which is a great college planning tool for you to use. Okay, next slide. So here's our agenda topics for the night. We're gonna talk about financial aid, sources of financial aid. We're gonna talk about the review the application process. We're gonna understand how financial aid decisions are made. And then we're gonna learn about paying for college and discover free resources. All right, slide number four. Types and sources of financial aid, that's our first topic for tonight. So what is financial aid? On to the next slide, please. Financial aid is simply money to help families pay for college. There's three main sources of financial aid, grants and scholarships, federal work study, and student loans. Okay, so grants and scholarships, those are free financial aid. They don't have to be repaid. Work study, work study is a campus job. It helps to pay for the indirect expenses. We can talk about what direct and indirect expenses are a little bit later in the presentation. Work study is a campus job. Students receive uh, a paycheck. It's usually bi-weekly. Um, it's usually minimum wage. Depending on the school, some schools will place students in campus jobs. Other schools, the student has to interview for the job. Um, they're always paid at least minimum wage, but depending on what the job is, they maybe get a higher per hour salary. Student loans. The reason why student loans are part of financial aid is because they have um, very good repayment options for students. The student is the only borrower on that student's loan. The parents don't have to co-sign it. Um, and then student loans must be repaid. Obviously, it's a loan. But students do not have to accept the work study or the loan part of the financial aid award. Okay, that's time to place. So financial aid breakdown. Undergraduate, so in the 2017-2018 award year, there was $184.1 billion available in financial aid funds. So there's a lot of financial aid funds available. Uh, there's a tax credit available for students and families when you're filling out your taxes. And um, so really what this shows me is that the federal student loans obviously is the biggest percentage of the financial aid funds. Okay, next slide, please. 
There's a new Mass Grant Plus program for students. This is the first time that the state scholarship program is going to be available at the community college level for part-time students, and it's called the Mass Grant Plus program. So by submitting your financial aid application, you're applying to all of these state programs, the federal programs. Um, the, the FAFSA form is all-inclusive. So start looking online, and then the fourth form of financial aid is the state and private scholarships. So right now, you should be looking for private scholarships. And Kelsey, do you want to come up and talk about the scholarship process at Frontier Regional High School? So just real quickly, um, on the guidance web page, there is a section for scholarships, and that is updated monthly. So you can be checking there for information on scholarships. And then as the year goes on, there tend to be more localized scholarships. Um, so we put together a mailing that goes home with all of our juniors and seniors, um, letting them know about scholarships that are happening um, a little bit later in the year. And you're also welcome to come to the guidance office, uh, or send your student to the guidance office to ask us. Um, or you can give your guidance counselor a phone call or an email that can give you some more targeted, specific scholarships that your student might be eligible for. That's good. Okay, so next we're going to talk about federal direct student loans. So the student, we already talked about the fact that the student is the sole borrower. There is no credit check on these loans. Uh, there is a subsidized version and an unsubsidized version. The subsidized version, that means that the student is not paying any interest while they're enrolled in school and during the six month grace period after graduation. So if they go on to graduate school, they're still in grace period. Um, there's no, so the unsubsidized loan, the unsubsidized loan, the interest starts to accrue as soon as that loan is dispersed. And the student has the ability to either make that interest payment while they're in school or capitalize it, meaning they postpone that interest payment until after graduation. Um, but every year the loan will grow by the amount of the interest payment. So the, the interest rate changes annually. Right now the interest rate for the 2019-20 academic year is 4.5%. So approximately, so if students borrow the maximum student loan for every grade level. So the, the grade level maximums are for an entering freshman, they are eligible for $3,500 of a subsidized loan and $2,000 of unsubsidized loans. Sophomores are eligible for $4,500 of subsidized loan and $2,000 of unsubsidized loan. And juniors and seniors are eligible for $5,500 of a subsidized loan and $2,000 of an unsubsidized loan. So if students were to borrow the maximum loan for every grade level, they would have approximately $27,000 of debt at graduation, and that would translate into approximately a $300 repayment per month for 10 years, which is the, the typical repayment term for a student loan. Students need to sign a master promissory note. So that master promissory note is good for the life of the loan while they're in school. And they will also do some entrance loan counseling. These are mandatory requirements. Students will do entrance counseling and exit counseling when they graduate. So all US citizens, permanent residents, are eligible to apply for these student loans. So students whose parents are denied a PLUS loan, which is the parent loan for undergraduate students, it's a credit-based parent loan. If parents are denied that PLUS loan, which is the federal loan program for parents, then students in the freshman and sophomore years would be eligible for $4,000 of additional unsubsidized student loans. And juniors and seniors would be eligible for $5,000 of additional student loans. Let me make sure I got all my information out to you. Okay, next slide, please. So merit financial aid. So merit financial aid is awarded based on other factors. If they're musically talented, if they're 
athletically talented. Not every school has merit financial aid, and the process can be different at every school how that merit financial aid is awarded. And students may apply for merit scholarships on their own. There may be a, a, an essay. Next slide. Sorry, I forgot to say next slide. So merit financial aid money typically comes from the institution. So each school can have different forms of merit financial aid. Each school can have different requirements. Typically, students will have to maintain a certain GPA in order to keep that merit scholarship. Um, and you want to make sure that you understand the terms and conditions of the merit scholarship. So you want to create a folder for each school and put that merit scholarship information in with all the other information for the school because you're going to want to make sure that you understand what those terms and conditions are for maintaining a merit scholarship from one year to the next. Okay, need they say, next slide please. So most financial aid is awarded based on financial need, a family's ability to pay for college. Most federal and Massachusetts financial aid is based on financial eligibility. Satisfactory academic progress. In order for students to continue to be eligible for financial aid throughout their college career, they need to maintain satisfactory academic progress. This is something that they're gonna hear all throughout their college career. So, for example, at UMass Amherst, in order to be maintaining satisfactory academic progress, after four semesters, a student has to have a 2.0 GPA. They also have to be progressing through their credit load so that they can graduate within 10 semesters. And so the first time that a student is not meeting satisfactory academic progress, they're put on financial aid warning. In other words, we warn them that they're not meeting satisfactory academic progress. And then we give them a semester to get their, uh, financial, their academic information up to par. And so the next time, if the next semester they're not meeting satisfactory academic progress, then they must meet with their academic dean, and they must put together an appeal, and they have to have some sort of outstanding circumstances that would warrant us to continue to give them financial aid and put them on an academic plan so that they would meet with their academic advisor every semester so that they would be, get to the point where they were meeting satisfactory academic progress. Okay, so the next slide. We're gonna talk about the application process. I can't stress to you enough how important it is to be organized. So now there's, there's lots of, NIFA has a really good organizer to help you stay organized. So for you parents who have high school seniors, you're probably at the point right now that you're looking at colleges and what schools are you going to apply to? What school is the student looking at? So while you're looking at all of the admission information, you want to be looking on the financial aid website and understanding what the application deadlines are and what the application process is. Because you certainly do not want to be late in applying for financial aid. Um, so each school can have their own application process, each school can have their own deadline, and each school can have their own process for applying for merit scholarships. So as, as soon as you are interested in, in looking and applying for admission to one of, those, one of the schools, you want to also be looking at what are the deadlines for applying for financial aid and what is their process. And also, so have a different folder for each school, put down the information that each, right on the front of the folder, we used paper folders. Um, and then we would put the admissions decisions in there, we would put the, the merit scholarship letters in there, so that you would have, when you get to the point that you're making your decision, you have all of this information right at your fingertips. Next slide. 
So there's the web address for um, the NEPA.org College Application Manager. Okay. It'll be very helpful to you. Don't submit applications late. Uh, just make sure that you are familiar with early action, early decision. Financial aid can have deadlines that are often in October or November. So the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, it's required by all colleges. It becomes available on October 1st. You can easily complete the application on My Student Aid mobile app. This is new. They're going to have a mobile app this year. Um, you can log in and get your FSA ID right now. The process for getting an FSA ID, you need to have an FSA ID, the parent needs to have one, and the student needs to have one. So if you have multiple children in college, parents, you only need to have one FSA ID. Okay. So right now, you can go in and start setting up your FSA ID. Make sure that you keep your password in a safe place because it can be somewhat cumbersome to try to retrieve it, to lose it, to reset that FSA ID. You'll need to answer challenge questions in order to get that reset. Um, the IRS data retrieval tool. So what happens is when you get to the financial section of the financial aid application, you can upload your tax information from the IRS you won't be able to see it on your FAFSA application as you're applying because of a privacy issue. Um, but you will be able to see it once you apply for financial aid. So there's a new FAFSA mobile app that's going to be available on October 1st. The parent will be able to go onto the mobile app and do the parent section. And the student with their FSA ID will be able to go on to the mobile app and see the student section, but you won't be able to see each other's information because of confidential information. And the IRS data retrieval tool will be available for that mobile app. Okay, next slide. So what's reported on the FAFSA? The citizenship status, so students must be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen to apply for financial aid. Um, you're going to have financial information for both the parent and the student. So if the two parents, the biological parents, are unmarried, regardless of gender, if they are the biological parents, those biological parents are completing the FAFSA form. If parents are divorced, it is the custodial parent. The custodial parent is decided by who did the student live with the most in the previous 12 months? And if the student equally lived with both parents in the past 12 months, then it's who provided the most financial support. And only that custodial parent's information is required on the FAFSA form. So the income that is asked on the FAFSA form is from two years prior. So for the 2021 year, we'll be looking at the 2018 tax information. Okay. Some untaxed information is not included on the FAFSA form. Foster care benefits, earned income credit, supplemental security <coughs> information, income. So there are some forms of untaxed income that you do not have to um, include on the FAFSA form. Okay, parent assets. The, the FAFSA form is going to ask you for your parent and student assets as of the day that you are completing the FAFSA form. So your cash assets. So I always advise families, pay your bills before you answer this question. Okay, because this is one of the questions on the FAFSA form that is not updated. 
do not include your primary residence on the FAFSA form. That's not, that's something that gets excluded. Cash, savings, investments, other property, that's your primary <laughs> home. Um, five to nine accounts, if you have five to nine accounts, that's considered a parent asset and needs to be reported. You don't include the value of your retirement, any life insurance, or the value of a small family business. Those are all excluded from assets. So, next slide. So, other financial aid applications. So, mostly it's the privates, the, the, the colleges that have a large endowment fund that are being a little bit more selective <coughs> on who they give their funds to will ask for the profile form. Okay. So, really interesting story here. When my daughter was applying for colleges, um, she put down on one of the colleges that, no, we were not applying for financial aid. And so then I went ahead and applied for financial aid for that school. And we got a phone call from the school saying, hey, wait a minute, you said you were not applying for financial aid. So be really careful on these uh, admissions applications because for some schools, your application will take a different path depending on whether or not you're applying for financial aid. So I had to correct them and say, oh yes, we are applying for financial aid. Um, so the profile form, it's $25 for the first application, and then $16 for each additional school. So before you start filling out that profile form, make sure that number one, your son or daughter is indeed interested in applying for a school that requires the profile form. And make sure that you, you understand what the deadlines are in filling out that profile form. Um, the profile form becomes available on October 1st as well. So WIPA has a great webinar on their website. So if you need help in completing the uh, profile form, they have a webinar on their website that you can look at. And then the third form of <clears throat> application is a college application. So what, what is happening is schools want to make sure that you're answering questions the same way on all three forms. So you, the FAFSA form is going to have one set of questions for you, then the profile form will have questions, but then there could also be an institutional application that asks you more questions. Um, one of the questions on these forms is how much can you afford to contribute towards your son or daughter's education? So be honest, don't put something that is out of reach and don't put something that is zero because the <coughs> primary responsibility for paying for college starts with the family. So put down something that is a legitimate number um, because these colleges potentially are looking at that number uh, when they're putting together the financial aid awards. They may take an average of what you put down on your admission application or your profile form or your college form and then what you calculated expected family contribution is. So put something that's reasonable. Next slide. So after you apply, so once you apply for financial aid, so each school on your FAFSA form has a school code. 002221 is the code for UMass Amherst. So if you put that code, we get the information electronically. So schools are going to store that information in their systems and, and will not upload it onto their system until you are admitted to that school. Okay, that's how it works at UMass Amherst. Um, so when you apply for financial aid, you're going to get a student aid report back from the federal government. And that student aid report will basically review all of the information that you put down on your financial aid application. And this is your chance to make sure that your information is accurate. So if there are, um, if you didn't upload your information through the IRS data retrieval tool, this, you can go in and do it now. If you um, were ineligible to use the IRS data retrieval tool and there are some errors on your financial aid application. If you forgot that, oh yes, I have two in college because the high school senior is indeed considered in college, make a correction. So this is your chance 
to review the information that you put on your financial aid application and make corrections to it. Because the more accurate your FAFSA information is, the more accurate your financial aid report will be so that you can make an educated decision if financial cost is an issue in terms of deciding what colleges to go to. Some families will be selected for verification. Next slide talks about verification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can forward it on to the next slide. Some families will be selected for verification. Um, so basically what colleges are doing is they're verifying the data that you put down on your financial aid application. So schools will reach out to you. More than likely, it's going to be an electronic communication. Um, so you want to make sure that um, what we did, what my husband and I did, was we set up uh, a separate email that was used for college admission. So that it wasn't, it wasn't something that was my son and my daughter's email. We set up a, a separate Gmail address so that we could keep track of the communications that were coming in from all of the different colleges. Um, you may have to submit your tax return. You may have to submit asset accounts for verification. Um, but your financial aid, if you are selected for verification, is not final until that verification process happens. So the federal government will select a certain percentage of each school's applications, but Schools can also do it differently. For example, maybe the schools do 100% verification so they will verify every single student that applies for financial aid. Or they may select all of the incoming freshmen for financial aid. So it really depends on the school whether or not you are going to get selected for verification. So on to the next one. How financial aid decisions are made. You can move to the next slide. So what colleges are doing is calculating a cost of attendance. So the cost of attendance is going to include direct expenses and indirect expenses. So the financial aid cost of attendance is always higher than, say, what the, the web address will have for tuition and fees and going board because what the financial aid office is doing is it's putting together a financial aid board based on a living budget. What is it truly going to cost that student to be a student for nine months? So it's going to include the direct expenses, the tuition and fees and the room and board, but then it's also going to put aside an allowance for books and supplies at UMass Amherst, it's a thousand dollars. It's going to include an allowance for transportation because there are certain periods of time that the student has to leave campus. Thanksgiving recess, the end of the term recess, spring break. So there is a, a transportation allowance that's built into the cost of attendance. At UMass it's $400. And then there's also a personal expenses, laundry, um, movies, dinner away from campus, those kinds of expenses. So at UMass, we have $1,000 built into our cost of attendance for personal expenses. So that indirect and direct expenses come up with the cost of attendance. Okay. So next slide. So here's how the expected family contribution. So the expected family contribution is really what a family is able to absorb for one year of college expenses. It's the same federal formula for all families. So some colleges though will use an institutional methodology. So for the federal and the state financial aid funds, we're using a formula called federal methodology. For colleges that are using the profile form, they're using an institutional calculation to come up with what your expected family contribution is. So the expected family contribution isn't necessarily what you're paying the college. It's just a calculation that the financial aid office is using to put together financial aid reports. Every question on that FAFSA form somehow plays a role. 
So the, one of the questions on the FAFSA form is asking for the parents' date of birth. So what's happening is they're calculating uh, your age. And so the younger you are, the more assets are available for college. The older the parent, the more of the assets are protected for retirement. So there are some ESC calculators out there that you can use. The College Board has one. Um, the FAFSA Forecaster has one. If you go onto this presentation, those websites are available for you to download so you can do your own calculation of what your expected family contribution is. Next slide. So net price calculators. Every college is required to have a net price calculator on their website. And it's an online tool that um, is only as good as the information that you put in to that online tool. And each net price calculator, each school can have a different degree of questions that they ask on that net price calculator. Some of them are almost like filling out the college, the, the profile form. They're so deep into the questions that they ask you. Um, the net, so basically what this is doing is coming up with what the net price will be after financial aid is available to you. Okay, so next slide. So here's how we do it. So we're looking at that cost of attendance that we talked about, minus the expected family contribution equals the student's need for financial aid. So if your expected family contribution is higher than the cost of attendance, then minimally the student would be eligible for that unsubsidized student loan. So an incoming freshman would be eligible for $5,500 of an unsubsidized student loan. So the cost of attendance is going to vary. For example, here at UMass, uh, we have an in-state cost of attendance an out-of-state cost of attendance. If students commute from their parents' home, that's a different cost of attendance. Um, so colleges are going to fill that financial need with different financial aid funds. Okay, so now we're gonna, the next slide is going to illustrate for you the impact on assets in the form, financial aid formula. So we have three families, family A, B, and C. They all make $75,000, but family A has no assets. Family B has $75,000 in assets. And family C has $150,000. And you can see that the expected family contribution, although it rises for the, differ the difference between family A and family C, there still is some financial eligibility there. So th this, this slide is basically illustrating to families the importance of saving for college. So even the family that has $150,000 of assets, that they would be eligible for financial aid. So the next one, the next slide, is showing families the impact that the income has on the expected family contribution. And here you can see that the families have a $75,000, $100,000, or $150,000 uh, income. They all have $50,000 in assets, but look at the difference between family A and family C in terms of what that expected family contribution does. So basically, it's income that is driving the expected family contribution um, in this formula. Okay, next slide. So how the formula works. So each one here, the cost of attendance, so the expected family contribution is not going to change based on the cost of attendance. So this slide is illustrating for you the eligibility for financial aid. So obviously College D, where there is a $5,000 expected family contribution, um, there's not going to be much eligibility for financial aid. But College A, that costs $70,000, that student's going to have a lot of eligibility for financial aid. So you should really be thinking about when you're applying for colleges, you want to have um, a financial safety school, but then maybe also have a reach school because you don't know what that school is going to give for financial aid funds to the student. Next slide. 
Yeah. Uh, you can just go ahead and fill the barrel. Just keep. Okay. So here we have the barrel. And the first thing that goes into that barrel is the expected family contribution because it is the family's responsibility first to pay for college. So the first thing in the barrel is the expected family contribution. The next thing that goes into the barrel are the grants and scholarship money, merit scholarships, grants that the school gives. The next would be student loans. In this case, this is for an incoming freshman. They've got the maximum loan that an incoming freshman is eligible for, a $3,500 subsidized loan, and a $2,000 unsubsidized loan for that maximum freshman loan of $5,500. The next thing we go is work. Okay, so the benefit for students to have a work-study job is it helps fund those indirect expenses that we talked about that are included in the financial aid cost attendance. It gives them that bi-weekly money to help them pay for um, those movie tickets and eating away from the dining commons. Um, a $2,000 work study award is reasonable. And then we have unmet need here. So this, this college costs $45,000. And so we have unmet need here of $5,500. So work study has to be earned and can't be deducted from the college bill. So the family, in this particular instance, would be eligible, would be responsible for the expected family contribution of $5,500 and also that unmet need. So unmet need is essentially need that the school, that the student has, that the school is not funding. Typically, most schools will have some unmet need in their financial aid reports. Um, ways that students can fill that unmet need outside scholarships. So if they're applying for scholarships on their own, um, perhaps an outside scholarship will fill unmet need. The financial aid cannot exceed the student's need. So that outside scholarship fund perhaps would fill the unmet need. So now we're talking about award letters um, and how award letters can vary. So college A, B, and C are all giving different grant amounts. I can't see my slide there, so I'm going to just turn around and look at this. So college A, B, and C all have different grants and scholarships. They're all giving the same amount of student loans, $5,500. They're all giving $2,000 of work study. And you can see that each school has different unmet need, okay? And it's because of the different amounts of the grants and scholarships. Maybe one of those schools gave a merit scholarship. Um, maybe one of those schools really wanted that student to come to their college because of a host of different reasons. So let's look at the next slide. Okay. So in this slide, you have College A that gave grants and scholarships of 27.5. College B gave scholarships, and College C gave no scholarships and no work study. My guess is that student applied late for financial aid at that school and missed out on the institutional grants and scholarships and the federal work study funds. They gave him the student loans, and the other thing that you will notice that is on two of these award letters is a parent loan. So the parent loan at College B and the parent loan at College C. Now all of these schools got to the same unmet need of $5,000, but they all got there different ways. And schools that will include um, a parent loan, that parent loan is a credit-based loan that parents have to apply for. So it's not even necessarily something that the parent potentially would be eligible for based on perhaps their credit score. So be wary of schools that are going to include parent loans as part of the financial aid award. Okay, paying for college. 
and go on to the next one. So when you're thinking about paying for college, you want to think about, you want to start having that kitchen table conversation with your son or daughter right now. What are you willing to pay for college? Um, how many years are you willing to pay for college? Are you willing to take out credit-based loans on behalf of the student? Are you willing to take out a payment plan? So if, do you have a 529 account? Do you have, so the past would be, have you saved for college? How are you willing to, how do you want to use that if you have a 529 account? How do you want to use that 529 account? You get to decide when you want to use those funds or in, in a 529 account. So if the stock market's doing really well and you can afford to pay the first year, maybe you want to let that 529 account sit up there for the first year. Um, the present. So how much are you willing to, bills are going to come probably twice a year, um, maybe sometime over the summer and then again around the holidays, if it's a semester-based um, school that they're attending. So how much are you willing to pay directly out of pocket, writing a check when the bill comes to you? Does the school offer a payment plan? At UMass Amherst, there's a 10-month payment plan. So five payments go to the fall semester, five payments go to the spring semester. So for a small amount of money, you can enroll in a payment plan. Um, so after you've thought about the past, the present, if you still owe money on that bill, then that's when you want to start thinking about a credit-based loan. Parent Plus loans. Uh, we have on the financial aid website, if you want to take a peek on our website, we have a whole section for alternative financing options. So based on what the, the credit terms are that you're looking for, are you looking for a loan with the shortest term? Are you looking for a loan with the longest term? Are you looking for a loan that defers principal until after graduation? So what do you, do you have credit issues? Um, whatever it is, there's probably a loan program out there that can help you pay the, the balance. MIFA loans. MIFA has great credit-based loans that you can borrow. Make sure I have everything here. Next slide. So some other considerations. Starting at a community college, there are some great scholarships available, mass transfer, commonwealth commitment for students who start at the community college. They're guaranteed admission to a four-year school. Their credits transfer. Um, and it's a great way to start college. So next slide. So here's the mass transfer. Um, you can transfer to, from a community college to a four-year public Massachusetts school. You're guaranteed your credit transfer, tuition credit, and a tuition freeze. Uh, the tuition rate program is for students who live outside of Massachusetts, and they get a reduced tuition if they're in a certain degree program. So free resources, we're on to the free resources. So this is just a slide <coughs> that tells you about the different ways that you can um, be in touch, free resources, definitely use the financial aid office. Contact them. We get, you don't have to be a student at one of the colleges to call the financial aid office if you've got questions. Ask about special considerations, appeals. We do all sorts of appeals for families who a parent has lost their job, or they're underemployed, or they've got high medical expenses that they've paid for. Um, colleges will go in and take a second look at your eligibility if you've got those kinds of circumstances. Um, next slide. That's the day. There's that's the day .org. Um, These are the sessions that help families um, fill out the FAFSA form. So, and then the next slide is talking about the after the acceptance seminars. So these are really great seminars. So what happens is NEPA goes into the local high schools. I'm not sure which local high I think pretty regularly they're at Amherst Regional High School. 
one of the local schools around here. And so the MIFA staff and financial aid folks will help families navigate the decision. Look, into, look over the different award letters that you've received and help you make your decision about which college, if you've got questions about um, which schools and navigating those financial aid award letters. So, what you can do now. Sign up for the, meet the emails, get that FSA ID, research the deadline, um, sign up for webinars. There's really, those, those webinars are great. Um, and if you've got any kind of questions, this is your chance now to ask me your financial aid questions. I know that was a lot of information. So you probably think, wow. Do you folks have questions? Yeah. So the, the asset belongs to the owner. So if your grandparents, so the question is, my parents have a factory man account for my daughter. Whose asset is it? It's your grandparents. Okay. Okay. But any kind of money that they would give her would have to be reported as untaxed income. How, is, how are the funds distributed from the fund? I mean, do they take a, is it by, is it by semester or? The question is how are factor nines distributed? It depends on where your factor nine account is. So basically, it's how you want to use it. So you get to choose how you want to spend your factor nine account. You don't have to use it every semester. You don't even have to use it every year. You can wait until the final year, use it all in the final year. It really depends on um, what you want to do with it. Okay. Yeah? Uh, are outside scholarships that a student might be awarded reported to colleges? Are they aware of that? Good question. Are outside scholarships reported to the colleges? Yes. So any outside scholarship any financial aid that is awarded from somewhere other than the financial aid office has to be disclosed to the financial aid office. And every school can have a different way of treating that outside scholarship. I talked about how outside scholarships can fill unmet need, but some colleges will take a grant that they've offered the student and replace it with an outside scholarship. So that is definitely a question you want to be asking the colleges Perhaps when you go on a tour, when you go to one of their open houses, how do you treat outside scholarships? More questions? Yeah. Uh, liabilities taken into consideration, like personal loans, car loans, that type of thing. The question is, are, is consumer debt taken into consideration on the financial aid application? No, it is not. Okay. But perhaps one of the colleges will allow that kind of, if you have like some extreme sort of debt that you need to explain, you could appeal directly to the colleges and ask them that question. Would it be worth paying that off for it? It has no effect on financial aid eligibility. He asked if it's worth paying it off. Okay. Yeah. You said something about a high school senior being counted as already a college can you explain what you meant by that? So when you're filling out the financial aid application for 2021, they're going to ask you for how many are in your family. So let's just say, for example, I have two children. So how many are in my family? Four. You would include, and how many are in college? The high school senior is considered in college. So you would answer four and one, one in college. You want to make sure that you include, so if you've got other children in college, the high school senior is the one who's applying for financial aid. So they would be in college. So if you have one child already, let's say sophomore in college, and you have a child who's a senior in high school, on that application, you would put how many in college? Two? Two. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the uh, FAFSA application, uh, is there a dialogue that goes along with some of these financial questions, like 
what income do you have to declare, and you know, those types of things. So at every, if you're filling out the FAFSA online, every question has a little box to help you go along okay, and, and answer your questions. And you can save your application. You don't have to complete it in one fell swoop because you have a password. Okay, so when you set up your FAFSA application, you're going to have a password. And you can go back into that application multiple times before you send it. Good job, thank you. More questions? Yeah? Uh, okay, so what's considered a small thing? What's considered a small family business? I think it's under $100,000 and 50 employees. So I am the parent of a junior. This is not something that I have to do, but next September I would be busy, busy, busy. Yes, but you could go in. It's called FAFSA Forecaster. And you can basically um, set up all your information on the FAFSA Forecasters and then upload it onto the actual FAFSA form. Okay, and it'll give you, as a junior, you could do the FAFSA Forecaster so that you have a good sense of what the application process is about. That's just part of the presentation at UMass Amherst. We don't look into parents' assets, but some schools may. So if you report, so some schools may, for example, if you report no assets but you have um, dividend and interest income, they may question that. More questions? So there's room, I think there's room for uh, eight or ten different schools on the FAFSA form. I think it's eight. I can't remember. Too much information to remember. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, you want to make sure that the schools that are most important that um, are, you want their information to get there first. So if there's more than room on the FAFSA form and you've got other schools that you need to send your information to, what you want to do is you need to check with the school. So first of all, they have to be admitted. But you want to check with the school that you're taking the information off the FAFSA form to make room for another school, that they have uploaded the information before you remove them. So call to the financial aid office. Hey, have you received my financial aid application? Yes, we have. Great. Okay. So make your corrections first before you remove them. So, so when you get your student aid report for the first time, look it over, make sure it's all the information is as accurate as it can be. If you need to make corrections, go in, make your corrections electronically using your FSA ID. When you get your corrections back, then call the school, see if they've gotten the most latest student aid information. And then if you need to remove schools, then you would remove schools. Do you have a question? Does the College Board share information with any financial aid organizations where financial aid people might get uh, students SAT scores or something and target those kids to um, have high scores? So a couple, I think, it, I think we're in year two now. The only, um, the only schools that I can see is UMass Hammers. I used to be able to go out onto the FAFSA form and say, oh, they applied at UMass, and they applied at Northeastern, and they applied at, so you kind of have a sense of what the students were doing through their financial aid application. But they changed that a couple of years ago. So the only schools that schools can see is the, that they're enrolled school. So I can't see any other, 
schools that the student is applying for other than UMass Amherst. More questions? Okay, well if you've got some questions that you would like to ask me privately, I'll stick around for a while. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation form. Uh, sorry for all the head turning. <laughs> uh, and if you've got questions that you want to ask me periodically throughout the academic year, um, more than happy through Kelsey to answer those questions for you.